responsibility doesn't care that you lost your job, you lost your house, you lost your kid, you lost your spouse, right? It doesn't care. How do you keep moving forward and carrying on with your day-to-day -day responsibilities of life when you're stuck in these intersections where difficulty and trauma and tragedy can stop you in your tracks? And I thought to myself, well, that's exactly what these guys in the endurance expedition did in 1914. And we have to do the same thing. We have to keep conquering, meaning keep moving forward no matter what. And that's just always stuck. Welcome back, guys. I'm really excited about today's podcast. We got my buddy, Antarctic Mike, on. I'm going to let him say his background because I, I kind of want to see Mike Hernandez's reaction to Antarctic Mike. <laughs> he's, got a, he's like a picture we were chasing each other across the United States. So, and I don't know if Mike, if you remember this, but every once in a while, a chair would put on the walls, like who the coming up speakers were. Yes. And if I was like, whatever gig I was at, you were either following me or I was following you. <laughs> and that's, that's why I reached out to you. And we actually had dinner like the next time he, he calls me up and he goes, he goes, Mark, I'm speaking in ha Hapaga Agaugi. Right, Long Island, like it's, it's hot dog, and that's where my office is. <laughs> so we had dinner, and we've been fast friends ever since. Yeah. So, so Mike, why don't you give us a little bit of your background, like how you got started? Uh, but clearly, one of the most prolific speakers, most highly uh, sought after speakers in the entire Vistage system. So, Antarctic Mike, please uh, um, inform us. I, I, my genesis of wanting to be a speaker goes back to when I was a freshman in college at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I went to a, a Christian seminar one night, this was in 1983, and I heard a guy speak who really could capture and keep the interest of a thousand college students, which is obviously a very difficult task to do. And I looked at this guy, his name was Tom Brown, he's still a good friend of mine, he lives in Atlanta, Georgia. I looked at Tom and I said, that's me. Now, I had no idea how I would get there in terms of what do I actually do and how do I actually make a sustainable living doing this. That took a while to get there. And that started in around 2005. And in 2000s, because I speak on the subject of Antarctic history, because I went to a bookstore back in the early 2000s and I read Shackleton's story, 28 men getting stranded in Antarctica for two years and all coming home alive. And I thought, Metaphorically speaking, the scenario they faced is no different than the, sim than the scenarios that we all face today as soccer moms, CEOs, college students, high school kids, whoever they are. Our marriages, our families, and our businesses are always uh, – hold on a second. I got to get rid of this um, – are all subject to the same kind of risk factors and the same kind of circumstantial events that are very difficult. And so I saw the parallel instantly, and I bought the book, and I couldn't put it down. And the parallels are incredible. And that's how I became a speaker, because I started telling the story from 1914 and then drawing out the points of the story and making them applicable to corporate situations, family situations, marital situations, and it's stuck ever since. Yeah, and Mike um... – Mike has a, has a phrase that he came up with a little while back, and it's one of the few times I've actually listened to someone say their kind of catchphrase and go, damn, I'm a little jealous. So, uh, Mike, do you know what I'm referring to? Is it the keep conquering or the let go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's keep conquering. Yeah, keep so, conquering because I so thought I'm to thinking... myself, how do you – because in life, right, we run into these intersections in life where difficulty is everywhere around us, right? Well, you know, responsibility never sleeps. Responsibility doesn't care that you lost your job, you lost your house, you lost your kid, you lost your spouse, right? It doesn't care. How do you keep moving forward and carrying on with your day-to-day -day responsibilities of life when you're stuck in these intersections where difficulty and trauma and tragedy can stop you in your tracks? And I thought to myself, well, that's exactly what these guys in the endurance expedition did in 1914. And we have to do the same thing. We have to keep conquering, meaning keep moving forward no matter what. And that's just always stuck. Well, so, so resilience. Yeah. That's a big, that's a big ingredient in the, in the equation, no doubt. Yeah, because for me, it's like uh, being stuck in Antarctica in 1914 for two freaking years. That's like the equivalent of crash landing on Mars. Pretty much. 
By yep. the time they can actually set up a rescue mission, it'll be six months minimum. The and that's if they're going to find you. So well, the irony is those guys had no rescue mission. They were their own rescue mission because the outside world had no idea this was going on. Right? They didn't have the luxury that we do of sending out emergency beacon signals on watches. You know, they make these watches where you can pull the pin and it yeah. literally now becomes a beacon. And if you pull it and it's not an emergency, you're subject to a felony. Um, I mean, they didn't have that luxury, obviously, back then. They they were their own rest. They rescued themselves, which is the real miraculous part of the story. Yeah. Unbelievable. Did, did they lose the ship and then have to make their way back to the ship? Did they yeah. make it to the South Pole or they didn't? You know. Well, the irony is they were going to step foot on land and then and then on foot they were going to cross the continent. Now, the irony is they never made landfall because the ship actually got stuck in the ice 20 miles off the coast and it never moved and it got crushed and it, and it sank right there 20 miles off the coast. So the irony is they not only not, didn't have a ship, they never made landfall. How did they stay like not get hypothermia? How did they how did they get off the ship? How did they get onto the land and so and were able to survive? I, they I, were, they the were never they were never on the land. That's what's I they never stepped foot on the continent of Antarctica in the entire trip. Wow. They were in the open sea and then they took life rafts to an a, a remote island, which is in the peninsula chain of islands off the coast. And then from that remote island that had no civilization on it. They ended up taking a 23-foot boat 800 miles to South Georgia Island, where is where's the original place they started. And there were people there, and there was civilization. And that's where they met a party that could send a boat back to rescue the remaining 22 that stayed behind. Wow. It's crazy. It's an unre I mean, it really is one of the greatest stories in recorded human history. How, how did they nourish themselves? How did they eat? That's, uh, that's the logical question. How did they eat? You know, the yeah. irony is they were never in danger of running out of food. It's called seal and penguin. And that's what they lived on for two years. Two and years. They didn't have variety. I mean, it's like, what's for breakfast? Seal stew. What's for lunch? Seal stew. What's for dinner? Seal. I mean, and water, there was no variety, but they had enough to live on. Water, they, I mean, you're not drinking from the ocean. So how did they? No, the, no, the cha you, you melt ice. Melt See, ice. When, when, when salt water freezes, it separates the salt and the water. So they could take chips of iceberg, melt it, and they could drink it. Um, and that was, of course, the challenge is, do you have enough fuel to heat the water? Because they couldn't eat ice because that would put them in danger of lowering their core body temperature, which, you yeah. know, if, if that thing lowers even by a degree or two, you can get killed. So yeah, they had to no, melt the water, and they never ran out of fuel because they used the fat from the animals as the fuel source. Uh, yeah, and, and the fat from the animals animals probably yep. kept them uh, uh, very well nourished. Um, Correct. The, the, the interesting part is the mental aspect of it. That's the how biggest takeaway of the story. Yes, correct. You know, how, how did they, uh, this has nothing to do with Antarctica, but what's coming into my, my mind is um, the, uh, the rugby team in the Andes Mountains. Yes. Um, I know that's different. They were on land. They weren't at sea. They weren't 20 miles off the island, but off the continent. But, um, you know, they, they turned to cannibalism right. uh, to survive. Um, and I would imagine, even though it sounds strange, would you rather be stuck in the Andes or would you rather be by Antarctica? <laughs> A part of me now is saying, well, you have plenty of food right. off of Antarctica. <laughs> and I had never thought about the the melting of ice and the differences there. Um, in South Florida, we want to uh, lower our body temperature a degree, two or twenty, very often. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. it, it's like 106 right now with the heat index. Up there. <laughs> um, but that's that's just fascinating. And you use that story as a way to, um, and Mark, I just wanted to jump in as as a way to build how you speak, what you speak on uh, in, in Vistage group, in front of Vistage groups and around the world? That's correct. The points of that story applied to everyday real life scenarios is how I've built my reputation and my career and how I spend my time. Well, you know, so, so let me jump in here a second because, you know, most of the things we're talking about in Vistage, like the, the members will have like, um, call it like eight different challenges. And each member has like one of the eight, right? right. Maybe two. Right. The, uh, so, but the overlap from business to business to business makes sense in the Vistage context because we're all up against the same type of challenges here and there. 
and maybe the challenge I'm up against you already conquered and vice versa. So, so, um, but there's a natural leadership thing. Almost every person that goes through the Vista system has a dominant personality. So then when you hear about other people who are leaders that overcame something, I can totally see how this plays right into the hands of how do you raise your game in leadership? Part of it's personal responsibility. So it's like, so how did he, how did Shackleton do that? How do you keep all those people's morale up for that length of time? Two freaking years. I mean, like Captain Bly lost them in about a week and a half, <laughs> uh, despite having similar skill set and being able to rescue them too. So like, what was his secret sauce that kind of, he was able to rise to that occasion? That's a good question. And that parlays into something I'll show you in a minute. But you know, it's funny you say that because most of these expedition leaders, whether it's Captain Bly, whether it's Captain Cook, whether it's Shackleton, anywhere in the world, when the expedition went awry, like most of them do. Yeah, like Hudson Bay. They, 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 exactly. They lost control of the crew mentally and emotionally. And we know this is true because this will tell you the story. More people died in polar history from mutiny. Mm than any other cause that makes I sense. think about that right when the, so when the leader the cannot point. when the leader cannot yeah. harness the mental emotional physical spiritual well-being of the team chaos is what arises yeah. right and and that leads to mutiny um and so it but to answer your question i think this is the single most important factor in the equation it's a little bit hard to see this because it's yeah, blurred yeah, out true. This, this is a picture where you see the ship stuck in the ice here, and then they're playing this game. Well, one of the things Shackleton did, he taught his guys, look, as good as they are, as hard as they try, that ship's not moving. That ship was locked in 20 feet of ice. And so metaphorically speaking, this ship represents everything in your life you can't control. And the last time I checked, that's a pretty extensive list for most of us, whether you're in Antarctica in 1914 or you're in the U.S. in 2024. And so the key is letting go of what you can't control and focusing on what you can. And the game okay. is their response to the circumstance of which they have 100 percent control, right? They can say yes, they can say no, they can go left, right, up, down, forward or backward. We have full control over our responses to all the circumstances that we have no control over. And I think that's wow. the key mentally to be able to embed that in people's minds. Mark is going to roll his eyes at me because I, I bother him way too much with the subject <laughs> of stoicism. <laughs> there you go. That's exactly what yeah, it is. The, right? the dichotomy of control, what, what I can control, but what you mostly, so that ship you can't. Uh, right. And you can put anybody on that ship as a metaphor, you know, rude people, yep. um, uh, um, any kind of uh, circumstances beyond your control, the economy, yep. whatever. You yep. just throw it in there. Yep. And then it's what you yourself can't control. I imagine in your Vistage discussions, it's uh, to chief executives saying, you know, you cannot control certain aspects of your business. And I know that that probably speaking trying to get psychological here that probably is tough for them to swallow i imagine this very big powerful chief executive officer she or he mm -hmm. uh, has uh, reached the the pinnacle of their profession and here yeah. comes antarctic mike to say <laughs> you're not in control of everything i imagine right i mean i think that's true if you look at many of these vistage ceos I mean, they started the business like in mom's garage with a $5 bill, right? Yeah. And they grew it and they had to do everything, everything that it took to get it from zero to let's say $100,000 or even a million dollars. They did all of that themselves and they're pretty talented people. Otherwise they wouldn't have been able to even get off the ground. But now as it starts to get bigger and bigger, and this is where it really becomes tricky, there's only 168 hours in a week, right? And they have to sleep for some of them. So now what they have to do is they have to let go of control and let other people start making decisions because the real litmus test of a leader is not how good you can get it off the ground and make it profitable. The real litmus test is how much can you get, how much control can you give away to replicate yourself in other people? If you can't replicate yourself in other people, forget it. 
It's going to be a hundred thousand dollar business with a couple of lucky hits along the do, way. Do you do you find that to be difficult for? And Mark, stop me and jump in. I'm I just I'm just asking because uh -huh. I'm listening to what is being said. Do you find that to be very difficult with CEOs when you're in there and number one, here's the first hard pill to swallow. You're not in control of everything. Number two, <laughs> you need to replicate yourself and, and it's not in a bad way, but I'm saying they are, they're very, uh, they're, they're to your point, they're very uh, 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 self-reliant. And now you're telling them as a very sought after speaker in this very exclusive setting, not only are you not in control, you need to find other people that are as good, if not better than you <laughs> at managing aspects of the business that you pride yourself <laughs> on being in charge of. I mean, I would imagine that doesn't necessarily go over well. Mike, it's not that it doesn't go over well. It's for some people, it's impossible. So I think I'm uniquely qualified to answer this question because uh, although Mike is a prolific speaker, uh, he's never been a chair. I don't think you've ever been a member either, right, Mike? No, so, I've not. That's correct. Yeah. So myself, I believe yesterday they told me I might be the only person in the entire system that's been all three. So I, was I think chair. Jim Jim Canfield might be an exception. Okay, that's that's fair. So it's right. I, but we're talking about you can count very them on few one people, hand. right? Very few people, even right. even all the time. The last sixteen years I've been involved with this. You could count them all on one Almost hand. Almost none, correct. That's and, correct. And two of them died. So right. so the deal is, it's like we're we're a, a select few. <laughs> so what happens here is this: the people you're referring to actually don't qualify for Vistage membership. So hmm. the chair is actually not just the recruiter for the members; they're also the gatekeeper. Right. So it's who should they be letting in? And what we're finding is like Mike and I were talking about this prior to you jumping on, Michael, is um, we're up against something right now. And I think mm. the, the chairs are actually surrendering their responsibility to be the gatekeeper. They're letting mm. in people that don't, don't actually deserve to be in. And how do we address that with the chairs? I've attempted to in a couple of cases we're, we're going to get to, but to fully answer your question is in order to qualify to be a member, because uh, let me give you some statistics about this. Uh, we've got 40,000 case studies of non-Vistage member CEOs. They average 20 million in revenue. They're worth $12 million. And they've got about 4 million more they could be worth if we fix what's wrong with their company. Vistage members average 65 million in revenue, 40 million in valuation, and mm. 13 and a half million wrong. So like the percentage of how much they're wrong is mm. this about the same. But when you look at it, it's like one business is a business. And the other one's more like an investment. It's right. like they're starting their journey to actually ring the cash register for a sick amount of money and hopefully lead the world a better place through philanthropy. So what happens is they have to have the right mental mindset. The very first thing is they have to be intellectually humble or they get humbled. So not everybody gets the right. qualified. <laughs> so what that's happens a great when, point. Right. So when Antarctic Mike and myself, when we're speaking, it's like when they don't qualify, they're a gigantic pain in the ass, right? Because they're <laughs> right. They're the CEO. They don't know how to take instruction. They can't take learning. They're a gigantic pain in the ass. They want to be told they're right. It's they want to be coddled. And it's my, like my routine is I walk in and say, hey, I talked two CEOs out of suicide in the financial crisis. Screw your feelings. I don't care if you like me. I don't care if you don't like me. You're pointing energy as your company in the right direction. We're cool. You're not. I'm a walking woodshed meeting. I'll take your ass out to the woodshed and slap you around <laughs> out of love because you need it. What's odd though, and now Mike's delivery is very different than mine. I've had the pleasure of seeing him deliver. I don't think, I don't think you've ever seen my presentation, Not but it's yet, like 98% nope. like love me. Like I walk on water. 2% nah. Not in San Francisco. Yeah, not in San Francisco. Not in San Francisco. They don't like not you. San Francisco, or Boston. Not in Boston. Yeah, no. New place likes me very much, right? So, so uh, how many presentations have you done, Mike? I, I don't, I don't look at scorecards. Um, realistically, seven or eight hundred. All right. So this is this is where Mike's smarter than me. I watch all the scores all the time and they drive me crazy. I get really pissed off and I call him up. He's like, I don't even know my scores. I'm like, holy shit, it's brilliant. Right. So the only yeah, number I track is well, the speedometer the thing, on a car. So I don't get a ticket. Other than that, I don't care about numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so the deal is, is like, uh, I don't know if you know this, Mike, but I used to run a volunteer men's organization 
And one of the things we used to do was we open every meeting. So, and you know, this sounds weird and like culty, but it's, it was just a bunch <laughs> of jerks doing nice things for Long Island, really what it was. But we started with nine men about 16 years ago and we got up to 650 men. It's international. It still runs on its own now. Wow. It's, yeah. It's about keeping men upstairs mentally by community service. So like you can't be downstairs mentally, no matter what, how bad your life is, if you're re-roofing the barn of an autistic children's uh, horse farm, right? Right, right. Like you just feel, you feel like you won the lottery. So like <laughs> one of the things we would do is to get the guy out of his head. We called it the out of head. So that they had to do something physical and then they had to do something goofy. So like, believe it or not, one time we played soccer, but with a football. And so I don't know if you guys have ever attempted that. It is the most ridiculously hardest thing you've ever done. Oh, that's done. very difficult. Too. We used to do that for soccer practice. My yeah. sides ached for about a week and a half, right? <laughs> yes. Because so you'd hit the thing and it was just spinning. And you hit it again and it was just spinning. And you hit it again and it was just spinning. <laughs> so it was crazy. And so a lot of guys were really athletic, too. I, I'm, I was one of the weaker ones in that department. But the deal was it snapped them out of that mindset. So what I'm thinking is, is when he had them play soccer on the ice or whatever that game was he had, now it gets them out of their head. They're not like wrapped up in their fear spiraling downward. They're being idiots. And I don't right. know about you guys, but when, when men are like, it's when we're, we get the permission to be idiots again, mm -hmm. we instantly go back to being 11 years old and like, okay, all right, I'm out of my head. Let's do this. No problem attitude. Let's go kick ass. That type of thing. I think that might've been permission. One of you need permission to be an idiot. My wife tells me I'm an idiot every day. <laughs> well, some we people are clearly a little better at it than that. others naturally. <laughs> like, like, like some people can do it without trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is true. So, so the uh, all right. So you get them in the right state. You 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 set a bar of Shackleton, which is really amazing. I mean, I didn't I I didn't know the story was that bad. Like it was that difficult, is what I should say. Right. Until you told me, like when we first sat down for dinner. I don't know right. what that was five years ago, six years ago. Right. So, but the, the, uh, the idea is though, is so now you set the bar for leadership now, like, uh, what, are, what are some of the takeaways that the members get after hearing you speak? Do you stick around and listen to that type that exercise? Um, yes, to a degree. Okay. Um, yeah. I would say the biggest takeaways are, I mean, cause the whole program is about finding, engaging and keeping better performing people. And yeah. so I think how you do, number one, let's start with finding. This is a perpetual problem for companies. So I tell the story of how Shackleton recruited the 27 men on his team. It's a great story and it's a model for how we should do so today. And you basically tell a story that is so off the wall, it shocks people. And it paints this picture of what people want to become. Because the question that's going through a candidate's mind, if I, if I leave my current company, and I go to work for Mark or Mike Hernandez or whoever it is. I go to work for that guy or that company. The question that's going through the candidate's mind is, what am I going to learn, do, and become that will make me better tomorrow than I am today? That's going through the mind of people. It's not about compensation. It's about, will I be better tomorrow? Better in every way. Better as a husband, as a wife as a parent, as a person, not just as a worker. How is my life going to be better if I go over there as opposed to staying here? So number one, you got to paint a picture that draws people in, and that's a story. So we go through that. Um, then we talk about the whole concept of letting go. And then we talk about the whole idea, and there's a lot of ancillary lessons around that um, that I won't get into for time's sake here. Um, but then I talk about why I went to Antarctica. I was so inspired by this story that I said, I'm going to follow my heroes. And I literally went to Antarctica twice in the year 2006. And I ended up running a marathon uh, on an ice shelf located 600 miles from the South Pole. This is the first time it had ever been done. A year later, I went back to the same place to run what they called the Antarctic Ultra Marathon. Technically, an ultra marathon is anything longer than a marathon. It could be a 50 kilometer event, which is 31 miles. That's only five miles longer than a marathon. In my case, it was 100 kilometers, which is 62.1 miles. And I did this, but the real takeaway of the story is how I trained. You see, I come from San Diego, California, and my wife, Angela, was not going to relocate to Minnesota, Saskatchewan, Canada, or Siberia, right, for training purposes. So I trained inside 
a commercial cold storage facility by going back and forth and back and forth in this very small 59 foot frozen metal space. It was a four metal walls and a concrete floor and racks full of frozen chickens, pizzas, french fries, and goat serum. And I would go back and forth and back and forth for hours and hours and hours. And what this did, this actually built these muscles more so than all the others. So the real value of the freezer, even though it was cold, it was 22 degrees below zero, but the real value of the freezer had little, if anything, to do with temperature acclimation, but rather it built the mental muscles of resiliency and strength, which are of course the most important muscle in the body of any human being. And I know this was the case because when I finished the marathon, it took me a little over seven hours to do it, but my instinctive thought was, is that all there is? Seven hours actually seemed more like seven minutes because I changed the whole definition of what difficulty was. And I, I really embraced the difficulty, the mental monotony of this in the freezer because I learned this as an 11 year old kid on a hockey team in Allentown, Pennsylvania. One night my coach said to me, Mike, you're gonna play the game the way you practice. If you make the practice harder, the game goes easier. In other words, what he taught me was move toward the difficulty, not away from it. Well Embrace said. the difficulty. And it's, it reminds me of the story of the buffalo. You know, when the storms come on the horizon, most animals run away. The buffalo is one of the only animals in the world that instinctively knows if they go into the storm, they will get through it faster with less damage. Right? Think about the logic. If this is the buffalo and he's moving this way and the storm's over here and it's moving this way, you see how you get through it faster with less damage. Yeah. Because when a storm comes, it's going to do damage. The only question is how much and for how long. And we can somewhat minimize that by moving into it. So the paradigm of moving into difficulty is what changed everything, changed everything in my life. And including how I ended up letting go of my wife last year when she died. My wife died after we were married for 34 years. She was sick for a very long time. But my point is how I got through that was by embracing it like I was back in the freezer and like I was the buffalo by going toward that difficult event as opposed to running away from it. When you look at people who take drugs and alcohol and depression and all this other stuff, that's, those are examples of people running away from the difficulty. If they would move towards it, the damage is less. I'm not going to say that there's no damage. But I think it's fair to say the damage is minimized by moving toward it as opposed to running away from it. I learned all of that from my guy Shackleton. I mean, that's amazing how this story that I've been telling for a living for 20 years now came back to serve me last year because Angela died in December of last year. It came back to serve me in the most important and difficult event that I'll probably ever live through. And that's watching your spouse walk to the front door of heaven. That's very difficult. But I think it's fair to say that my difficulty was somewhat minimized by the fact that I had this mindset that really came from the freezer and it came from Shackleton. If, if, I, if I can jump in here, so there's two things that I want to talk about. One, I need your permission to. So one is um, musicians do the same things. What they'll do is I had a bass when I was learning uh -huh. how to play. Uh -huh. I had a bass that would um, – it had uh, – it's called action. So when the strings are against the against the neck, when they're mm -hmm. really high up, it's much much harder to play. Right. So if you play a bass that's actually kind of out of whack, it actually builds your muscles better than if you're playing the actual bass you'll play live. Then when you pick oh, that thing up to play live, you're smoking all over the place because it feels like nothing to you. It's the same similar mentality you're talking about running into the uh, the storm like buffalo. The second one is I need your permission to, to discuss uh, like out loud on this. Do I have it? Of course. Okay, so, so you and I have had some discussions offline. And I got to tell you, Mike, you know I've, I've counseled probably 300 men through rough time periods with their relationships. Like I just Correct. with my, my cardiologist right before coming on, uh, jumping online with you guys. Yep. The, uh, I've got a, a man that I'm coaching right now that you know very well, Michael, that uh, – that, um, you know, he's going through a messy divorce. So it's how do you mm. minimize the damage of all that stuff by having the right mental mindset? Mm. But um, Antarctic Mike's wife was uh, paralyzed in a climbing accident and had to take medication because of her paralysis. That, and that happened before he actually married her. 
Before I met her. Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, so he had to actually, she had to take a, a very large amount of medicines in order to function on a daily basis because of the pain correct. and uh, anguish she was in, and that's what ended her life early. So it, it was- It clear, it was, and I'll, I mean, for the record, and I can't prove this in a court of law, and I'm not stupid enough to try and go after the drug companies, but I can tell you for a fact, prescription drugs under a doctor's watch. Okay, this was not taken illegally or abused. This was actual prescriptions written by licensed MDs. That is what took Angela's life prematurely. I can tell you that. I will swear on that till I go to my grave, and I know I won't lose. But I can't. I can't prove it, and I'm not smart. I'm not stupid enough to try and take on the drug companies. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I know for a fact that that's what happened. Well, but here's one of the things, though. When when uh when he told me about it, you know, like, you know, people say, "Why complain? Who'd listen?" I'm the guy who listens, right? So <laughs> you know, and partly the reason why is because someone did it for me 25 years ago, and so you kind of have like a debt that you have to pay by paying it forward. If you get my meaning. But let me say it this way. I feel a debt that I have to pay it forward. When I hear pain in another man's voice, right. I reach out. Like I go towards it as opposed to away from it because I don't want a man alone with his pain. Right. That's not good for society. It's certainly not good for that man. Right. So I reached out to Mike and he was in a great mental state of mind. So you know, his, his wife just died and in a way that could have been avoided for a multitude of reasons had right. fate worked out differently wasn't angry, wasn't coming from victim mentality, nothing like that, kind of understands it uh, from his perspective. But I, I, I got to think it goes back to what you do for a living, you know? I think there's no question that the replication of this message, because I tell it so often, right? It's like a record playing in my mind on a, on a loop. I think because of that, because it's the message is now so embedded in my mind, in my heart, and in my whole life, um, that that clearly was like, an antidote, let's just call it, that I've been hooked on for a long time that clearly addressed some of the difficulty that I had to live with. And there's no doubt that it worked. I, I got to assume one other thing, though, because we're uh, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time that you were able to give us here today. I want to talk about this other thing, too, that comes up on a regular basis between me and you. OK, so uh, Mike and I are not we're not completely on opposite ends of the political spectrum but we're on opposite sides of the dead center. So I lean, I'm a center left, he's center right. And then we have these phenomenal conversations whenever we happen to be in the same city, we'll, maybe we'll go to dinner or what have you, and uh, talk over the phone clearly. But you and I are able to have conversations at a level of caring for the other person's opinion, like out of respect. And it's because like, um, I, know, I know what it is in my case. I think what it is in your case, you let me know, I think it's because you're a faith-based man. I think when I think when you're spiritually grounded, I think that has to be a part of the picture for any two people who have opposing views on anything to actually come together and have a productive discussion, whether it's two friends like you and I, whether it's a spouse and another spouse, or whether it's a parent and a child, regardless of the relationship, if you got two people on opposite ends of the spectrum, maybe not to the extreme ends, but clearly on the other side of the center, and you're going to have a productive discussion, if you're not grounded spiritually, I think it's the, the pitch of the hill is steeper. I'm not saying you can't climb yeah, yeah. it, but I think it's fair to say that it's more difficult. Well said, because I think you're onto something there. The basis of my second book, The Woking Dead, is about displaced religiosity. So if I made the argument that every human being is uh, born religious, do I need to defend that argument to both of you? Either I don't of you? think you do. Well, you, you're giving me like a squint-eyed look there, Mike. So let, let me let me flesh out the idea. <laughs> so the concept is this. So there's a man named Blaise Pascal. So now, he actually, just the other day, he turned 401 years old. <laughs> so he was an early mathematician who was, and all, almost all science 400 years ago was about proving that God exists through their chosen field of science. They were chasing the God <laughs> concept. And it even shows up today. It's called the God of the gaps. What, whenever we don't know something scientifically, we tend to assign supernatural cause, causality to it. That's just a normal case of human beings. So what he argued is that there's a God-shaped hole in every human's heart. Now, he argued that's because God wanted to fill that hole because he was religious. 
What an evolutionist would say is, no, the reason why we have a God-shaped hole, he's right, we have a God-shaped hole in each of our hearts, but it's because whatever enabled our ancestors to survive long enough to procreate continues in the next generation. So that's why I have blue eyes. Mm. So like my wife got me 23 and me one time, and I was like, how much does this cost? She said, 85 bucks. I said, I said, you know, I'm, I'm a type of asshole that if you gave me $85, I'd send you all back the same picture of the same single celled organism and say, thanks for the 85 bucks. <laughs> so I'm like, well, how far back are they going? Because we're all African, right? Uh, 65,000 years ago, a uh, cataclysm happened worldwide. Likely the eruption of the island of Toba plunged us into a mini ice age. Uh -huh. What that did was it wiped out humanity down to 8,000 human beings. 2,000 of the 8,000 left Africa and became every other ethnicity on planet Earth. All of us on this phone, on this, on this uh, Google call is are African. So the reason why I have blue eyes and not brown eyes is because uh, my ancestors evolved very close to glaciers, hmm. so Northern Europe. So in order to survive, we had to cover with animal skins, which meant very small parts of our bodies were exposed to the sun Hmm. long enough to absorb enough vitamin D in order to metabolize calcium. And if you didn't metabolize calcium, you didn't live long enough to procreate. So the only people who live long enough to procreate had blonde hair, light skin, blue eyes, and now I get skin, skin cancer as a result, you know? So hmm. if you have uh, darker eyes than me, darker skin than me, darker hair than me, it just means your ancestors evolved closer to the equator. That's the only hmm. difference. So when we sit back and look at it from that perspective is, once we started to climb down from the trees in Africa, we could suddenly, our physiology changed. It went from climbing in trees to being able to run and mm. deal death from far away. So now if you had one proto-human or hominid, the uh, throwing stones at a lion, the hominids lunch. Mm. You get 50 humans or hominids throwing mm. stones at that lion, the lion's lunch. So as soon as we started to collaborate, we became the apex predator in every single ecosystem. And the 2,000 of the 8,000 in Africa that left and became every other ethnicity entered every single ecosystem and the apex predator went extinct within one month. So what that means is the only apex predators you had to worry about anymore were other human beings. Hmm. So it turns out the tribe with the better religion the, the um, outcompeted the tribe, the weaker religion or no religion. And frankly, best way to, to, to sum up early religions were kind of like, how do you deal with bad luck? So when you were like uh, sacrificing a bull, so Zeus wouldn't mess with your crop. But if you died, you were me it was meaningless. There was no utopia, there was no heaven for you to go to. You were just a plaything of the fates, of the gods. Mm. But once you develop monotheism, well, now this tribe is forestalling the, the heaven in uh, the utopia in the afterlife. You um, can now coerce or win over a, a large cohort of mostly young males that are now willing to lay down their life in protection of and provision of that tribe. That mm -hmm. tribe outcompetes that tribe. So what we're talking about is political tribalism in something called displaced religiosity. So as mm. Western democracy gets more and more secular, that natural religion in us has to go someplace. I'm arguing that it goes into politics. We're creating a new religion of national politics where all mm. compromise becomes a sin. And it's mm. a special type of stupid. Like, you know, <laughs> like, like, look, at my, look at my shirt. So, so Mike and I have had some real conversations about areas that I go into where I have uh, some difficulty and they are Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, and Boston. And the, but he, like, well, rather than me talk for you, do you remember those conversations we had, Mike, early on? I do. Would you ask me? Yeah. My question was, if you are considered a liberal, Which and I this is an audience of liberals, why are they throwing stones at you if you're one of them? Well, so, so the, the, what it comes down to is simply this. See, if you present as a conservative to a group of liberals, they may or may not listen to you, but they don't hate you. So the, what, what happens is they're not going to throw stones at you. If I present as a liberal, yet I sound like a conservative, I come across as a heretic. <laughs> and really what it comes down to is that where I think that the, the liberal cause is failing 
is we're, we struggle with identifying the wackadoos and being able to say, <laughs> no, that's a stupid idea. And these are all the reasons why it's a stupid idea. We kind of make them right when they're wrong. Because I came up with this yesterday, Michael, presenting in, in Atlanta. It's because that group of wackadoos are allergic to reality. So what happens is they're not basing their their, their uh, concepts in reality. They're suffering mm. from what's called blue lies. These are lies told to benefit a coalition. I'll go mm. into greater details about what that is in a separate uh, a separate video. But the idea is that they're getting wrapped around their axle about showing which side they're on. So therefore, they have to have their pronouns in social media, and I call bullshit on that. Then mm. what they have to do is they have to... Uh, say no a trans woman is a woman men can get pregnant all the wacky stuff <laughs> that the hard right laughs at just like the, all the wacky stuff that the left laughs at about right. the right right what we have to do is kind of we have to quiet those voices i would argue in both cases it, it, uh, but the problem is and mark and i have discussed this and and i've always worked at the intersection of politics and the media and having been for the last five years a local political analyst here on television in, in English and Spanish, one of the challenges is that oftentimes, with all due respect to, to my friends in the media, they amplify the extreme voices. Of right? course they do. <laughs> and, and I explained to them, you know, for example, um, we now have, and the entire world has apparently seen this, uh, there is a political action committee that is clearly not in favor of former President Trump that paid God knows how much money mm -hmm. on this one billboard. By the way, there's 25 of them on the Palmetto Expressway in Miami, Florida, which is south of <laughs> by half an hour. But this one billboard that has a photo of Fidel Castro on one side, his profile, mm -hmm. and on the other, uh, Donald Trump, his profile, and it says, no to dictators, no to Trump. So... What I said was, so there were 20 folks out there protesting it. I said, there's 2.7 million people in Miami-Dade County. You add where I live in Broward, you're getting closer to 5 million, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you cover all the way up to Palm Beach County. That's a one-day story at most. And it's one billboard out of 25. But it hasn't been a one-day story. <laughs> it's been three days. Now, if you're the guy that's putting together the billboard and you just want to irritate Donald Trump supporters, my God, whatever you paid for it, multiply times a thousand in terms of the impact that you will have, right? Mission accomplished. On the other end, you're protesting it. You may be firing up people, whatever, but this is going to result in some other billboard, God knows where, maybe in the center of Manhattan. I don't know. But we're amplifying the extremes and that's part of the reason why i love saying to everyone i was i worked for a democratic president and a republican mayor who's now a republican congressman and you know what i found that they had a, a, in common that they just wanted to get shit done like there are <laughs> things that they want to accomplish that uh, 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 it, the vast majority of their agendas were to accomplish something for the public good but we'll take little pieces of ideological positions they took or whatever and make that the story of their careers or let's not say their careers, let's say their tenures, right? right. And I always uh, I always say, I, I voted for George W. Bush twice. I also have voted for every Democrat since. Hmm. Doesn't mean you agree with even 80% of what each one of them stood for. Hmm. It's that they I, you identify a little bit more with their policies than you do the other one, but the, the fact is when you have this very powerful, and I love, we like to say that the traditional media is dying. Uh, they're not dying, they're evolving. Now they're on TikTok, now they're on other platforms. Yeah. They're still reporting and you're still taking it in as a consumer, but they're, they're amplifying extremists. And, and, and that's wrong because not every Donald Trump supporter is an insurrectionist. Uh, not every Joe Biden or Democrat is, uh, you know, about pronouns and, and about introducing socialism, you know, and, and yet that's what a lot of folks have concluded in the United yeah. States yeah. because yeah. they hear and see these extreme voices. And I tell folks, you know, uh, my Republican friends, I, say, I have born again Christian friends that are Democrats and I have atheist friends that are Republicans. 
Hmm. But that doesn't mean that you 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 have to conclude, you have to judge someone because of their political affiliation, of their let's not even go into racial, that that, that speaks for itself. But okay. it it's disappointing. And I imagine it infiltrates not just Seattle and and San Francisco where Mark is is presenting. I imagine it it infiltrates it, it's part of where my Antarctic Mike presents uh, yep. across the country. Do, do you find that to make your job more difficult? No, not at all. I, I don't think it really moves the needle in my scenario much at all because I, I'm i very careful about what I say and what I don't say. I'm very conscious of this. For example, um, I really don't get into any of the gray areas of politics. The only time I ever did, and I didn't know this, but I learned from it. I was in New York City, and I was trying to make the point of having the best interest of the people at the front and center and not yourselves. Like when you run a business, right? If you're a CEO, your company will do a lot better if my decisions that I make are in the best interest of all of my employees and my customers, not necessarily me, the business will do better. And I used an example. I said, let's take politicians, whether, whether you support Hillary or whether you support Trump. I think it's fair to say that a lot of the public at large doesn't feel like any of the politicians, regardless of this side or that side, has our best interest as citizens in mind, right? And I got stoned by the New Yorkers, and here's why. Because I put Donald Trump in the same category as Hillary wow. by saying any of the politicians don't have – in other words, I was saying Trump doesn't have our best interest in mind, and neither does Hillary. The fact that I put them together even in the same neighborhood – I mean, I got jabbed and stoned and clobbered with hockey sticks and rakes. And I just said, okay, from now on, I'm not going to even mention anything in the gray area, and I haven't since. And I don't, I don't get in trouble for it, and I don't have people running after me with hockey sticks and rakes anymore. But what about – and, and maybe not – I, I suddenly realize what my challenge is. <laughs> I do that every single every single meeting. <laughs> but do, you, do you find it, it – and this is my, my final question to the Antarctic Mike, but like do you find it – Let's not let's not say politics, but let's say certain perspectives and the maybe going back to my original question, um, mm -hmm. certain perspectives w that CEOs and, and Vistage chairs and others may have in the rooms that you're in. Mm -hmm. Do you find certain beliefs that are common in rooms that you're in that are more difficult to break down in, I don't know, 60, 75 minutes, however long you speak? Mm -hmm no matter where you are in the country, right. or maybe there are particular parts of the country where certain beliefs that you are actually uh, the the antithesis of in what right. it is that you speak, do you find that, to, is there anything that you find to be harder to break down? No, because the breakdown doesn't have anything to do with the beliefs. The breakdown has to do with, are they actually going to do something with it? Oh yeah. The actionable part of the takeaway is the challenge, right? The challenge is they agree with what I say. It makes sense. I mean, what I present is as simple as two and one equaling three. And you, there's, I mean, really, unless you're really at the end of the spectrum and you're just a complete idiot, which that's not very many people, you're going to get what I say and you're going to buy into it. The challenge is, will you actually make different decisions based on what I just brought to your conscious level of thinking? See, I'm not even telling people anything they don't already know. I'm just moving it from the back burner to the front burner. Now the question becomes, will you actually do something differently as a result of being cognizant of what it is that I just moved from the back to the front? All right, so let me jump in here because there's a thing that I've been wrestling with. I wrote it into my third book. There's, there's a world-famous chair named Ozzy Gontang, Mike. Yep, that, uh, San Diego, I, yep. Yeah, so when I first got started, I was hearing him quoted. So I actually contacted him for my third book uh -huh. I quoted him in the third book. I just wanted to do it accurately. So I said, uh, so I reached out to him on LinkedIn. We had a phone call. The guy, he's probably in his late eighties now. This guy still has a growth mindset, Mike. Yeah. So his, his quote was this, um, people join Vistage to grow their business. What they get out of it is personal growth and then their business grows. And get this, Correct. this guy's a former monk and claimed chairing was the spiritually the most rewarding work he ever did. <laughs> also the most difficult. So I called him up and I said that quote to him. I said, am I quoting you accurately? He said, yeah. I said, you know, that's not been my experience. Hmm. 
And he didn't get upset with me. He wasn't like, ah, who's this snot nosed kid? You know, I've, I've forgotten more <laughs> about sharing than he'll ever know. It wasn't like that at all. I felt him lean forward in the call and he said, tell me more. Hmm. And I said, um, I said, it's been my experience that people join Vistage to grow their business, but then they spend an inordinate amount of their time trying to look good in front of each other. And that is not a growth mindset. So I'm calling out the members on the biggest bullshit of Vistage. Hmm. It's what happens here is uh, I would argue that shares want to create impact, at least the good ones. I would argue that the better speakers want to create impact too. Mm -hmm. I've got some evidence for that, but we don't have enough time to go into it. And the, the, uh, the idea is the third one though, impact is actually requires the member to give their best. And sometimes they act like it's a gym. Sometimes they just pay, but aren't really going there. Right. Right. So what I do is I call them out on that. And how they do it is in ever sophisticated ways. Like they'll say like, uh, uh, like uh, let me show you what hiding out for a high level business member is. <laughs> hey, I got these two employees that are fighting. What should I do about it, guys? Well, how about stop wasting our time? Like that's not done at this level. <laughs> right. You've been ignoring your sales and marketing for the last 20 years and it's costing you 20 million bucks. What are you doing about that? So that's where <laughs> like I can get the members to actually take ownership of each other's business for the betterment of the other for the same in return because right. what they'll do is they'll say this really sophisticated thing like yeah i'm having the chair hold me accountable they can't there's a financial relationship there the member can bully the chair so and they know it on some subconscious level they can't bully each other so mm. then i call out the toughest guy in the room i make him stand up and i said you know let me <laughs> let me let me take a guess if you uh if you gave me your report and i see what's wrong with your accounts what's wrong with your business and then I hold you to how to be better in an uncomfortable way. I'm betting you'll repay that from that favor for me in spades. And the guy kind of like leans at me. He's like, you know it. So it's like, how do we raise our game and create what I'm calling an ethos of deliberate discomfort? All mm -hmm. growth comes from being uncomfortable. What I like what you do, Mike, is that you do it in a very like non-confrontational way by setting an ideal that's ridiculously difficult for anybody to have achieved no one can claim that that's not an impressive accomplishment. It's probably the most impressive accomplishment of true leadership. You're setting the bar so high, then they're being aspirational to get up there and raise mm -hmm. their game. Because the real deal here is this, like even the three of us, we're not in competition. So I want to see you succeed. And right. then I want it to bug me a little bit. Like I got to raise my game too. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So yes. it's like, I want you to stretch and that will help me stretch. That's what I see it as. But Mike, we're up against the clock here on, on your timeline. Just wanted to thank you for your time. Mike, if, if you want to hang around for a little bit, we can finish our uh, political conversation. I think it's worthy. Thanks for your time, Mike. Yeah, I uh, totally understand. Yep, yeah, thank yeah, you. Let's do this again. Okay, guys.